So this is behind the scenes of the HQ. This is where this is where the grit is made. Have my coffee, as always. Got the boomstick in case we want to listen to music. This is by far and away the best portable speaker that you could buy. I think it retails for about $200, but I got it last year on Black Friday for like $75. So stay tuned on Black Friday for the deals. It is the UE Boom 2. Waterproof, I bring it in the shower. Unbelievably loud for the size of this. You could travel with it. Amazing, amazing quality. I copyrighted the boomstick, so if you get one, you are not allowed to call it the boomstick. Got some headphones, because my neighbors be noisy as hell sometimes. They're like mowing their lawn at 6 a.m. and then again at 6 p.m. and then again at 2 a.m. Like, I don't know what they fucking do with their lives. So we got some noise canceling headphones. I bought these ones off Amazon for like 80 bucks. I don't use them that often, admittedly, uh, but they're good to have. Have my phone sometimes when I'm working and when I get up and I get into like a creative mindset, because usually I'm most creative first thing in the morning. That's when I like to do my like outside of the box thinking and when I get my most work done, I will leave my phone in my room because it helps me kind of stay off social media and stop looking at all the notifications and emails that pop up throughout me working. I have my calculator because math, I have my notebook because written math, and this is the new Snowball Snowflake, whatever it's called, I don't know, some kind of mic that I have in case I am recording something. Now I did upgrade the camera, the body frame, so someone reached out to me via Instagram, a guy named Ben. Pretty big photographer on Instagram. Ben, shout out Ben, what's up? Ben Trills on Instagram. Really good photography work, by the way, like portrait. So it's at B-E-N-T-R-I-L-L-Z. If you wanna check him out, this is his page. He reached out because he saw my last YouTube video talking about the lenses, and he's like, dude, you gotta upgrade the, the frame. Where he said, the next upgrade you should do would be the frame for your body, and that means, you know, the actual camera itself. So I actually am selling this camera, the a Sony A6000, and I'm upgrading to the A6000. 500, so the 6500, which has, uh, it's much better for video. Uh, it comes with 4K as well as a few other things. So I have the new lenses, I have the new camera coming, I have to get a new mic, I got a new tripod. So I upgraded a lot of shit, as you can see. And that's it, but I gotta get some work done before I head out for the trip. So I'm leaving for Denver tomorrow morning. I'm super excited for it. Only thing is, I checked the weather, and I know tomorrow when I get there, it's gonna be 85 degrees all day. By the time I leave next Tuesday, it's supposed to hit like 50 degrees, which means I'm going to have to be packing a lot of different clothes. But the types of clothes I wanna to talk to y'all about today, specifically are jackets, because winter is coming. This ain't no Game of Thrones shit. I wanna talk about style some fashion, some apparel, because jackets are probably the staple of your outfit outside of denim in the winter. So I, I have a lot of jackets and I just wanted to show you guys some of the jackets I have. They're all extremely affordable. The majority of them are $50 or less, but I wanna show you, I think it's like six or seven jackets that I constantly rotate in and out of my wardrobe throughout the winter. So the first jacket we got up on my list is just the plain bomber jacket. Now I know these have come into style over the last few years, uh, but I suggest getting one for yourself. This is just like a navy blue bomber jacket. This is actually from Gap. Probably the only piece of clothing I own from Gap. This was, uh, I believe at the time I bought it like last year, maybe 55 bucks. And I'm sure Gap has sales <coughs> or coupons that you can use given that they're like a big brand store. Um, so this is simple. What I would suggest guys, cause you know, it's 2018. This is kind of the style now. They should end for the most part, unless it's a longer jacket, they should end right where your pockets kind of are, right where the top of your pants start. The shirt that you have underneath should be a little bit longer or should match where the jacket ends as well. And you want the, you know, you want the jacket sleeves to kind of end right by your wrist. You don't want them to be too long. And that's when the jackets start looking kind of baggy or kind of shitty, you know? So you want like a slim fit kind of style of jacket. And that's exactly what the bomber jacket does. And I will link all of these, uh, all the stuff that I talk about throughout the videos, whether it's like tech or, or products or apparel, I will try to find them on the website that I bought them from or wherever I got them from and link them down below if you are interested in getting them. So this is the bomber jacket from Gap, navy blue, size medium. And for reference, I am like 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 about 165 pounds. Next up, we have just this tan beige parka jacket. 
Not really sure what parka even stands for, but this one's a little bit longer. It's uh, it's good for like fall and probably, you know, on a less chilly night in winter. None of the jackets I really own are great for actual winter, but I'm more about style than that. You could throw on like there's there's room underneath here, so you could throw on a sweatshirt, you could throw on um, some some other big article of clothing underneath if you want to. And again, you know, I like to have them small and kind of tight around the wrists, but this is a little longer and they got the little string um, in case you want to tie it down a little bit. But this is one of my favorite jackets. It comes with the hood and everything, kind of multi-purpose. And I like to get a different variety of jackets just because they match the different jeans you have and, you know, a lot of different colors and whatnot. So this is the Parka. I believe I got this one from H&M, maybe for or 50 bucks. Next up, we have uh, one that's kind of similar to the Parka. I would almost call this like a Kanye jacket, right? Because everything Kanye does now comes in either like tan or some kind of like navy or uh, forest green. Just like another very slim fit jacket. It's kind of like the Parka, but it's different material. This one's a lot slimmer. It's a lot tighter to the body. And I think it's a little too tight if you try to zipper it up, but it's a lot longer as well. And it goes down pretty far. Now this is not gonna be everyone's style, I understand that. So this is probably the most like kind of outlandish jacket that I have. Like I said, it's kind of like the Kanye style where it's, it's pretty noticeable and it might look a little weird. It's even got the strings coming down, but this is my style. So I feel comfortable wearing this out. Uh, it's just another jacket to kind of add to the wardrobe. It is in forest green and it's actually a size small. So a lot of the clothing I get, right? Like I said, I'm 165 pounds, 5'10". I would fit in a medium. I could fit in a little, this shirt might be a large, but depending on most of the stuff that I wear that is long sleeve. So like button downs as well as jackets, I usually have it at a medium or I size down because when you size down, it gives you a slimmer fit. Like it's not supposed to do that, right? But it gives you a slimmer fit around the body as well as a slimmer fit around the uh, around the arms. So when you're looking at long sleeve stuff like jackets or button downs, I would suggest, you know, even if you think the medium fits you well and you're a medium, try the small and just see how that fits because it might actually fit you better and it might fit your body a little bit better. So that's, see that one I have in small, the other two are in mediums. This one, um, obviously, you gotta have a pea coat. You gotta look professional if you're rolling up to business meetings or if you're going out on a date or something like that. So this is just a nice fitted pea coat. I believe I got this from Nordstrom Rack. This is definitely the most expensive jacket that I have. I think it was about $100, but um, I, I'm perfectly okay investing in a, uh, a jacket that's, you know, $100 or more if it fits well. This one kind of sh shuts off right here. There are ones that go longer, but I'm not really into like the really, really long style. I think this one fits me well. And I even like kind of like to pop the collar on on pea coats. Now I, I wouldn't normally wear a t-shirt under this. I'd probably wear something else, but we'll get into that in another video. Nordstrom Rack, I think it was like 100 or $110. Let me see the company that it's by. I would suggest getting yourself a pea coat for sure. This is by Kenneth Cole, Reaction. Ooh. I think this is my last one and probably my favorite one. I, actually, I also have a, a bomber jacket in black, but you already saw a bomber jacket, so it don't matter. The denim, baby. I fucking love denim jackets. Now, a lot of people will make fun of you for going denim on denim. Oh, it's the Canadian tux or whatever the fuck they call it. Listen, motherfuckers, if you look good in denim on denim, rock the denim on denim. Not really, don't do the same color. Don't be like Justin Timberlake where you're wearing washed denim on washed denim, but like black denim, I don't really mind, but you should be wearing some kind of uh, chino pants. Like these are dark blue chino pants. That would go well with these. You're supposed to mix and match the materials if you go with denim heavy on top. Um, that being said though, I love this jacket. I love how it fits. You know, it cuts off right at the top of my pants. It's a nice fit around the wrists and it's nice and slim around the arms as well. I mean, you could roll it up. And this is probably one of the heavier coats I have. So you can get a denim jacket that looks slim and is still like very warm throughout the winter. And there's a lot of different ways to wear this. Obviously you can wear it down. Um, a good style with denim jackets is wearing like a hoodie sweatshirt. Go cop yourself a big dog hoodie sweatshirt, throw it on under the jacket and you've got yourself a nice, you know, a nice casual, but also you can go out in that kind of outfit, right? Denim is always good to go out in. It's kind of like a, a universal material that you could wear to a lot of different settings. So we have the parka, the bomber, Another parka, denim, pea coat. If I had to narrow it down to three jackets, I would probably knock out the two parkas. I think pea coat is good because it's obviously professional and it looks really good when you are doing things that you know you need to be a little more formal for. I think denim is super universal. It's also a little bit warm. You can wear it when you're going out. You can wear it to a friend's house. You can wear it like any night pretty much. And it keeps you a little bit more warm than the bomber jacket. The bomber jacket is more of a stylish look, very slim fit and you could wear it you know, spring or a less chilly winter night. And the denim jacket I forgot to add is from ASOS. 
the ASOS is ASOS is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite websites to, to shop at. Now, ASOS.com is a retailer out of the UK. They are only a website though. So they ship from the UK. However, it's all free shipping and it's all free returns. They have a ton of men's clothing on there. So what I would suggest doing is order a bunch of shit from there, different sizes, different styles, and they send you a prepaid shipping label. So anything you don't want, you literally just put it back in the bag, slap the label on, return it to the post office, and boom, you're good to go. So ASOS is awesome. That's where I've got the denim. I've gotten other jackets and plenty of other clothing, pieces of clothing uh, from ASOS.com. So I would check out Nordstrom Rack, ASOS.com. I would check out H&M, PacSun, Gap, all of those stores, websites, whatever. Try to get ahead of the jacket trend before you know you, you, it gets into winter and then they start getting super, super duper expensive. Now is the time to grab them. Try to look for a coupon. Most of those sites will have coupons eventually. So if you find something you like, maybe favorite it, bookmark it, wait for yourself to get a coupon and then snag it. But you really don't have to spend a lot on jackets, right? Like you can get three or four of those jackets that I have right there for about 150 to $175 and you should be good for the winter as well as, you know, I've had some of these jackets for a couple of years now and uh, absolutely love them. So diversify the revenue, diversify the wardrobe. Now I gotta figure out what shoes I'm gonna pack. That's a whole different vlog. <laughs> if, you, if you ask, then you shall receive. If you insist, then I'll oblige. Yeah. They know my history, so they bring up the past. When I step inside a booth, they expect me to spaz. I just hop inside a Rory, I'm driving it fast. I love to roll up some gelato and listen to jazz. Tell me who is if I'm not the codis. I'm stepping on their necks in my Prada loafers To dominate the game, bro, you gotta focus I'm out in Dubai on Versace sofas Emirates out the Paris, put it working YSL corporate at my show, fuck a Birkin Still house pouring heavy, sipping my own bourbon G-Eazy, Gerald, Fight Club, Tyler Durden, yeah hey. I'm always playing both sides Model money, rap money, bags double size Yeah, recognize, yeah, it's all mine Believe I'm a prophet off this jawline <laughs> Buying jewelry is getting old My jeweler said 80k is getting sold yeah. Them diamonds hidden, boy, you getting bold Ten shots to the necklace, we getting thrown yeah. Every album automatic platinum How many rappers doing that? I'm actually asking These things happen when it's dark, how beautiful is platinum Three in a row, I'm really out here back to back to backing yeah. Mixing Prada with Balenciaga Remember when I didn't have a dollar to my name now these girls chasing cloud will swallow for the fame And now my bank balance and my followers the same M's Kept my circle tight, I'm with the same friends Zero to 63 seconds, not the same bins I live different, my whip different, my chick different Only popping up with goddesses, I date tens yeah. I step on stage and the stars born Ten years ago, nobody knew that I'd be far gone And let it drip and head to toe and come to guards, huh? Garage is running out of space to put these cars on <laughs> Silk Chanel scarf on. Play me a beat. I feel I need something to barf on. Yeah. Champion mentality like. What's up, dude? What's up? We've arrived in beautiful Denver. This is the Airbnb for the weekend. Man, it is beautiful out here. Is this widescreen? Yeah. That looks even cooler on widescreen, huh? Hot tub. Mountains. These are my marketing clients. They just told me to fly out here. Let's get after it for a weekend. Let's get it. Is this a real little red fox? Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna climb up the rock and go say hi to the red fox. We told her not to, for the record. This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I better put this on World Star Hip Hop. World Star. And then can I toss them some beef jerky? Yeah. He's from Although your hey butt's very prominent in this, just so you know. What? Last <laughs> moment that Ashley ever lived. I'm gonna get it. <laughs> we're getting it on camera. To death by a fox. Three nine seven five. I should have gave you the bag up there. How heavy are those? Ah. Ah. I'm gonna really take. <laughs> 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 yeah! Hey! Oh, we have to drink. Oh, yeah. That didn't count, you didn't drink yet. Ow. 
No, it counted, motherfucker. Yeah. 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 Are you freaking out? Yo, this thing is a fucking monster. Oh, wait. Denver was a good time. I didn't really film as much as I would have liked to, but uh, but I enjoyed the experience. Good time. Back in the HQ. Uh, and we're going to switch gears for a second to end this video. And I think a lot of you guys will find this interesting. Um, this is a very behind-the-scenes look that almost no one else that is freelancing or running a business or you know making money will really give you this, this view. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to talk about... Moolah, baby. We're gonna talk about some money. Money, 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 money. We got envelopes of that mo money, cash. Now, uh, these are actually all the buy-ins for my fantasy leagues. I like to keep them all in cash for some reason. Anyways, we're gonna talk about money. I wanna talk about, I wanna show you all of the money I've made this summer through fantasy football, through my side hustle, through my passion, through, through this, right? And, uh, I'm not doing this in any way to brag. I'm not doing this to, um, you know, there's nothing to brag about. I would say 99% of you make way more money through your job than I've made through fantasy football. I'm doing it because, <clears throat> it, it's funny, because it's October 18th right now. Thursday, October 18th. And we're about halfway through the football season. And I think my subscriber count on YouTube is probably around 13,000-ish, uh, somewhere around there. And the large majority of my subs now probably have come from the last week of August, or you know, mid-August all the way through now, which is crazy because I've had, you know, I, I still talk to a lot of the subscribers that came in when they first, first came in, uh, when I started my channel like three years ago. So for a long time, it was just like the, the core people that I knew, the same subs that were I was interacting with, right? And now all of a sudden my subscriber count went from like 5,000 this summer up to around 13,000. So there's a million new faces and a lot of you guys don't like know me that well outside of those videos. And uh, that the reason is because I vlogged my entire the entire portion of my life after I left my full time job working in New York up until probably June or July. So the, all the behind the scenes work that I did 
um, all the vlogging that I did that included, you know, the money, the marketing, the, you know, my friends, relationships, and my passions and fitness and technology and all that kind of shit. Uh, I, I did that weekly and a lot of the newcomers obviously don't know that because I stopped doing it in July to more uh, to focus more on my channel and the fantasy side of things. Um, and I'm getting back more into the vlogging, but I want to give you guys a behind the scenes look at, um, you know, the business side of this and, and, and all the different revenue streams that I've been able to create via this side hustle. And my main goal, like I really, really, really want to inspire people to you know start their side hustle start their passion and hopefully give off ideas and inspiration and motivation to you guys um to show you that there's a lot of different ways to do this stuff and it's funny because all right so last this was the first summer that i really looked at what i'm doing on youtube uh from a business perspective and uh realized that i could really do something special here and you know hopefully turn this into a full-time job now i'm not there yet and we're gonna we're gonna get into the exact numbers of how much i've made and where i think it's going and where i can improve and things like that but if i look back last summer right the summer of 2017 great summer by the way actually horrible summer for me but this was the first summer that i that i offered a product that i tr that i even brought in any revenue and it was the draft guide, right? I made this e-magazine and I sold it for $4.99. If you're an OG of the channel, if you're a fantasy football OG, uh, you remember that one probably. It was it was pretty shitty. It was like, uh, I mean, the content inside was good. And that's what I, I always key down on, on making sure the content is good around everything else. But the, the magazine itself was uh, not very aesthetically pleasing, but I did the best I could. I sold it for $5 a pop. And when I did this, this was the first thing, like I said, I've ever sold via my YouTube channel. Um, and I was definitely nervous selling it. I had no fucking idea if anyone was gonna buy it. I had no idea if anyone cared. Like if, you know, that's when you start realizing, that's when you get a sense of who your audience is, who the people, who your customers are, um, how much loyalty your customers actually have to your brand. When money is on the line, that differentiates a lot of things for you and gives you a much clearer picture. So last summer, I sold the draft guide for $5. I sold just about 200 copies, give or take. So I made $1,000 off the draft guide. At that time, I was like, that's fucking awesome, right? Like $1,000 for making this draft guide. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, you know what? Like I sold 200 copies uh, off an audience of like 3,000 to 5,000 people, right? And I realized that my growth jumped up last summer from about 500 to 5,000 subs at 10 X. And I'm looking at this summer and I'm like, I think, uh, you know, a similar growth pattern is going to follow. And obviously it wasn't that drastic. I didn't go from 5,000 to 50,000, but we more than doubled. We almost tripled our audience size. And with tripling your audience size, that obviously means you are tripling your customer base, the amount of people that could potentially buy your product. So I'm like, okay, five, focus on this as a business pers uh, business opportunity, there's a lot of money to be made, right? And that had never been my my point of, of starting this channel. That had never been my my initial like thinking, right? I never put money first. And I think that's why my brand has built like a loyalty. And I feel like the, the subscribers are all, <laughs> Steve calls them like a, a fucking cult that a lot of you guys are. It's funny because, you know, I see the same people and we always like talk about the same shit, my subscribers. And, uh, and that's because I built loyalty over years and years of just giving off free value. And it had never been about making money until this summer when I realized that I could. And it's not like, I'm, it's not sales first for me. That's never going to be my thing. That's never going to be my, my motivation. But I think if you have a lot of value to give, which I realize that I do to my audience, then you're almost doing them a disservice by not offering them that. And um, what I realized, I put out a video in the beginning of the summer asking you guys like what you wanted. I was like, you know, what products, services, what specific tactics or, you know, whatever would you guys buy? Like, what do you want to see? And I was surprised that the majority of the comments in, in that video were based around exclusivity and access to me and like a community feeling. And then it hit me and I was like, geez, these people don't need me to give them statistics and numbers and stats and this kind of shit in terms of product offerings, because there's always going to be someone better than me at making Excel charts and you know running the numbers and giving you DFS projections and that kind of shit, right? I don't need to be doing that because there's a million people that do that. What they want from me since I've built up this brand loyalty is access to me. Um, and uh, and I realized like that, that it needs to be community-based. 
It needs to be brand building and community based in order to scale things. And that made sense because I immediately thought of like the fantasy footballers, right? They do offer products. They offer like their draft kit and a few other things. But for the most part, they are making their money and their revenue from a community based podcast. And they're the biggest in the business. There's no way anyone is making more money than the fantasy footballers right now. And they've done it through that brand loyalty. So I started thinking, you know, I've been, you know, and it's an ongoing process and I definitely have not refined it to a T and there are a million things I need to improve upon going into next summer, but I'm proud of what I've pulled together considering. Um, so I made a thousand dollars off the draft guide last summer, 2017, and then probably through YouTube AdSense, maybe another 1200 or $1,300. Um, and we'll get into this because a lot of people are like, oh, how much do you make from YouTube? You make fucking nothing off YouTube AdSense. In terms of the revenue that you bring in, it is nowhere compared to the amount of money you can be made making through other revenue streams. So I want to get into exactly what my revenue streams were, how much I made from them, and you know, hopefully projecting my growth for next year. And I've actually not sat down and broke down exactly how much. This is the first time I'm going to be doing this with you guys. So... Um, so this should be interesting and I have a list of I have on my mind eight different revenue streams that I pulled in from fantasy football alone this summer and the first thing is the draft guide sales because that is the majority of the revenue I made now like I said last summer I sold it for five dollars I sold 200 copies this summer and, and and last summer I don't think I put it on sale until about August so this summer, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I think I'm just going to offer them a pre-order, right? I had not even started it. I had no idea what was going to be in it. I didn't know what I was going to improve upon, where I was going to make it, blah, blah, blah. So I think it was either in April or May. And I was like, all right, y'all. So I'm putting my draft guide on pre-order right now. And if you buy it right now, you're going to get it for a discounted price up until July 1st. On July 1st, I'm going to raise the price though. So it was like demand, right? And that's something you have to create within a product offering. Why are people gonna purchase it now as opposed to four months, right? You don't need the draft guide until late August, but I had people purchasing it everywhere in April, May, June, because they knew by July 1st, they were gonna get a cheaper price. So what I did was I, I priced that pre-order price at $20. And I was nervous as shit to do this, right? I was thinking maybe 10 bucks, maybe 12 bucks, um, because my mentor, my business coach was telling me, he's like, dude, you got to up the pricing on this thing. People will buy it. You have an audience, you have a loyal following. He's like, they will purchase the, uh, the price point that you offer to them. And I was really nervous because like, you know, people are only willing to purchase something that's so expensive in the fantasy community, right? It's it, most of these draft guides go for around, you know, 15, 20, 25 bucks. So when I put it at 20, I was almost like, oh, the audacity of me. Like, I'm an asshole, no one's gonna buy this. So I put it at $20, which is 4X the price that I put it at last year, right? It was five bucks, put it up to $20 on the pre-order pricing. And uh, I'm gonna actually pull up right now exactly how much we made from the pre-orders. This is an Excel sheet, right? I exported all of the orders I've had from Shopify this year. Um, and this is like the, the database. This is the dashboard, I guess you could say. And it gives you a quick look at, you know, the sales and stuff you've had, and you can put in the different date ranges and whatever. So I went back to, I think like March 1st up until today, and it'll bring you all of the sales and stuff you had. So I just exported it to an Excel sheet so I can easily filter it. And what I did was I filtered it to the draft guide because there are other products that were in this, you know, purchase guide. There's apparel and stuff, which we'll get into. So I went with the pre-order. And I switched the name of the, the guide a few times because when it went from pre-order to regular order, I had to switch the name. So it exports as different items, like the name of the item is actually different. So we have pre-order. I think this also fits into it. So this is the number of pre-orders and the sales we've had from it. So we're just going to highlight this line. If you're an Excel person, you'll know what I'm doing. We'll highlight all of it. So the count, as you can see it down there. I'm not sure if you can actually see it or not, but it says 165. So there was 165 pre-orders, right? So I almost matched the number of sales all from the pre-orders. And if I hadn't done the pre-order thing, I'm, I'm positive that my sales wouldn't have been anywhere near it. So we have pre-order sales, 165 times that by 20, we're looking at some of about $3,300. Now, as soon as soon as July 1st hit, though, we'll go pre-order, we'll break that down, pre-order. 
regular order. Now let's check it. 340 total orders at $30. Now, that's the big key here. I upped the price from $20 to $30. That was another big step for me. I was very hesitant to up it to $30. And this is just a lesson I have learned from you know, going off on my own in terms of money and in terms of charging. Because every time I've charged a price that was higher than the previous price, I would get super nervous to do it. And I was like, people are gonna pay for this, blah, 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 blah. If there's one thing I've learned through charging, whether it's B2C, like business to customer, or B2B, whether I'm charging for my marketing services, it's that people will pay. People have a lot of money in this world and they are willing to spend it if you are offering them value. So I'm wondering if I had upped the price to 40 or 50, if people would have still bought it. Probably not. I think the highest I could have gone was $30. And as you can see, there were 330 people, 340 people that purchased it at $30. And we're gonna do the math on this. We're looking at $10,166. $10,166. $10 you add that up and we are looking at six 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 shout out push thirteen thousand four hundred and sixty six dollars off of the draft guide think about that for a second Third, over thirteen thousand dollars off this draft guide that's a fuckload of money, bro. That's a lot of money for someone who literally just fucking set up a camera and started talking into it a couple years ago. Now I made $13,500 off of an e-product. That was number one. So I went from $1,000 in sales on my draft guide last year up to $13,500 this year. Clearly there's a market and clearly the market has spoken that they like my shit. You know what I mean? And that's why I need to be looking at this from a business perspective because there's so much opportunity. So that is number one. Within my Shopify store, I also offer apparel, right? I have my, my big dog sweatshirts, my big dog crewnecks, t-shirts, hats, all that kind of shit. I never push that. I just have that set up in my store. I don't really like, I never get up in my videos and I'm like, hey guys, purchase my stuff. But people support the brand so they randomly, you know, I don't get a lot of sales off this, but I will check. Um, So there's like the coffee mugs, crewnecks, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts, yeah. So we have a total of $445 in apparel sales. Um, next up was also a pretty good money maker. Uh, and this is affiliate marketing. Now, if you've never heard what affiliate marketing is, it's basically you affiliating yourself with another company or another brand. So for, for me, you know, for a lot of you guys that follow me fantasy football throughout the summer, I used the draft app, right? It's called draft or, you know, fan draft fantasy, whatever. And it's where I did my best ball drafts. Um, and you saw a ton of my mock drafts I did on draft. And what you do is like you talk to that, you talk to that partner, that brand, whatever, draft. And you say like, hey, I want to have a partnership or whatever. I want to be an affiliate marketing, uh, affiliate marketer for you. What they do is they hook you up with a promo code or a link. And you give out that link or that promo code to your audience. And for anyone that signs up using your promo code or your link, you will get a kickback from their sign up. Now, fantasy football is very, very generous in their affiliate marketing, especially the platforms that are on there and up and coming now. For draft, this one in particular, and I wish I almost pushed it harder, and I probably should be pushing it more in season now, because that's a huge revenue driver. For every single person that signed up using the promo code BDGE on draft, I got $30. So what I would do is every Friday throughout the summer, I did a mock draft where I did, um, you know, I, I would just do a mock draft throughout the summer with different uh, settings and things like that. But pretty much every other week, I don't know if anyone noticed that, but every other week I would do my mock draft on the draft app. And, uh, and you know, each, each video I'd always say like, guys, this is like a perfect uh, website for you to practice your mock drafts and get ready for your actual drafts um, because it's cheap. The sign up is like, you, you can use a dollar on a single draft or whatever. And I would get, I don't know, 3,000 to 5,000 views on each of those videos. So all I needed to do, I would plug that in. Hey, hey, use my promo code. You get a free $3 entry into whatever. And that's the thing with affiliate marketing. They give you kickback, but they also give you some kind of special offer. And that's why you see like so many people in the space 
Be like, oh, sign up for DraftKings using this promo code. Fi sign up for FanDuel using this promo code because they get a kickback. And you also get some kind of special offering when you use their promo code. Every time they use the BDGE, I got $30. Every time I made a video that I would plug that into, I got about 3,000 to 5,000 views. So every time I did that, I would get somewhere from eight, 10 on a good day, 12 to 15 signups. So think about that. For each video I made like that, if I'm getting 10 people to sign up using my code, I'm getting $300 to make this video pretty much. So you can go into, they all have their own affiliate dashboards pretty much where you can um, track this stuff. And this is drafts right now. So throughout the summer, and it comes in, you could see like who exactly signs up, how much they deposited in, and then here they use your promo code. So throughout the summer, we had a total of 192 depositors, and this is the total kickback I got from it, right? 5,670 plus 90, which is 5,760. So that is for affiliate marketing, 5,760. Sponsorships. Sponsorship, 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 ship, ship, ship. Actually, uh, I'm an affiliate with Amazon as well, but I make almost no money off Amazon, so I'm not even gonna include that. And uh, I'm an affiliate with Fantasy Jocks too, but they're already a sponsor pretty much for my video, so I'm not gonna include them in terms of the affiliate marketing. I only made probably a few hundred dollars off that, but sponsorship. The sponsorships are not affiliate marketing per se. Um, they can be in a sense, but sponsorships are more exclusive. They're more of a brand saying like, hey, we wanna sponsor this video or we wanna sponsor your channel for the next five videos. We are going to pay you um, X number of dollars or we're gonna pay you $20 CPM. CPM means cost per 1,000 impressions. So if they wanna pay me $20 CPM and I have a video that gets 10,000 views, then I'm going to make $20 for each 1,000 views, which is $200, right? So you can do sponsorships that are more exclusive um, and the sponsorships I've done so far this year, I haven't done a lot of sponsorships. I don't really, I, I don't really use them much. One, because it's hard to find sponsorships that are super authentic, you know, products or services or brands or apps that I actually use that I, you know, any sponsorship that I'm going to promote, I want to make sure that I use or that I see my audience getting value from. Um, otherwise people are going to be like, what the fuck? This is super salesy and it seems corny. And like, you'll see a lot of videos where people just plug sponsorships into their videos and it's, it doesn't flow. It seems fucking weird. And I, I just don't want that to be part of my channel. If you find a good one, you could build a good partnership off of it. There had been one company in which I did a one episode sponsorship with, and they paid me a total of $500 for that. So we're gonna put 500 on, on the list for that video. And then the, the interesting one is, obviously if you watch my fantasy videos, you've seen that every video is pretty much sponsored by Fantasy Jocks. And Fantasy Jocks is a company that I've been working with since I was maybe 21 or 22. So I'm 20, I just turned 26 in August. Uh, so probably three, four or five years or whatever, I started writing their blog posts. Uh, eventually I left my job and I put out a vlog saying that I was, you know, going to go freelancing and, and, uh, I, I'm in the marketing business, which I'll get into the end of this video and fantasy jocks, the, the, the CEO or the, you know, the president of the company reached out to me cause I had still been blogging with them every summer. And he's like, Hey, we're looking for someone to outsource our Facebook and Instagram marketing to, um, would you be interested? I said yes. And I've been running with them since then. Uh, and then this summer it turned into like, hey, listen, I'm I've been building my brand in the fantasy football space. I know I just happen to be running your marketing, which is it's just ironic or coincidence that we both happen to be in the same space, right? I do their blog posts, uh, I do their marketing, and then I was like, listen, I want to have a partnership in which uh, you also sponsor my videos. So our contract is, um, you know, it, it's like a monthly payment, but part of it is through sponsorship and part of it is through the marketing I do for their company. So it's kind of a mix and we don't have a set price on what exactly the sponsorship is for that video or what, what exactly the sponsorship is for um, the sponsorship price is from them on a monthly basis or a total basis. But I would, if I had to estimate what it would be at the end of the contract, I would say it would total upwards of four and five thousand dollars so I'll, I'll say forty five hundred dollars in total because it was like a 10 month contract pretty much and that was really it and that's all i have for sponsorships that's a big area of improvement that i can probably move upon next summer when i have a bigger audience and that is you know one two three four four revenue streams right there the fifth is the draft weekend the live draft weekend i had in new york city where i had a handful of my subscribers come out and fly out from all over the country and 
and I rented out an Airbnb in New York City and we had a live fantasy draft. They flew out on Friday, they left on Sunday. We had a draft in the Airbnb on Saturday. We went out in the city and whatever, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Really fucking good time. Um, the league was 10 people, it was full of 10 people. Only eight of my, I only got eight of my subscribers to end up, um, I guess, purchasing a ticket or whatever, or, you know, buying the draft weekend. Almost, I almost had the ninth one like 50 different times. I just ended up having one of my friends from my hometown come to New York and draft with us and, and be in the league and whatever. So we had eight people and I priced this at each person paid $1,100 to be in the league, to come for the weekend. That does not include their airfare. So we had three people come from California. We had someone from uh, Michigan, Raleigh, Virginia, like all over the place, right? Um, so that doesn't include airfare. It was $1,100 a piece. Times that by eight, we're looking at $8,800. Obviously that wasn't all profit. I'll get into, you know, revenue versus expenses and things at the end of the video as well. So $8,800 right there. The crazy fucking part about this is while obviously that wasn't as much revenue as like the draft guide, which was over 13K, the $8,000 is, the, the $1,100 a piece was like the staggering part because I remember when I was talking to my mentor, he was like, listen, you need to have some kind of high ticket product, some, some, some product that's priced highly. And I'm like, there's no way I can possibly make a draft guide or something, something that's fantasy football related in terms of like statistics and numbers and analysis that people are going to be willing to pay four figures for. Right. And I was thinking outside the box. I was trying to think creatively on how I could do this. And I was in LA and I was listening to this girl, uh, Natalie Ellis. She is the CEO of this company called Boss Babe. Um, I don't know if every, any of you guys have heard it, if there's any girls in the audience. I don't know if there are gonna be any girls in the audience, but if you know the company Boss Babe, it's really big on Instagram. If you go on Instagram and check them out, they're, they're, they have a big following. Um, so I was with my mentor and he is friends with this chick, uh, not this woman, this lady, the CEO of Boss Babe. And I was listening to her talk and she was, saying like, if you're building an audience online, one of your key goals should be to be able to bring that audience from offline to in-person. And I was like, shit, dude, that is such a good idea. And then I saw, you know, you see the fantasy footballers doing something where they're doing a countrywide tour, right? They stopped in New York, Philly, Dallas, Arizona, uh, San Diego, maybe. I forget where they went. Basically, they just, they, they did like a, like a fucking uh, a tour as if they were a band and they would just do one of their podcast episodes on stage and they would sell out the arena or the the venue that they were at right so i'm like oh my god that's so true like this is the future of of content creation is getting these in-person relationships so i'm like this is what i'm gonna do like i i had to look at my you know i didn't want to just copy them and try to do the same thing because one it wouldn't that wouldn't sell like that but two you got to be like super aware of what you bring to the table like what are my offerings and i'm like what do i do best and I'm like, I'm trying to build my brand around being a lifestyle brand, you know? And that's why I did the vlogs for so long because I wanted to show people like how I live, the things I'm passionate about and my lifestyle. And I want people to resonate with that. And I want people to build loyalty to my brand via me as a person and the lifestyle that I live. And I'm like, okay, what do I do best? And I'm like, fantasy football. I love New York City. I love being a piece of shit in the city. I love going out there. I love partying with my friends. And I'm like, let me combine those two and make that a revenue driver. So that's exactly what I did. And uh, the eight dudes came and I couldn't have asked for a better weekend. Every single one of them was cool as shit. Like I couldn't have planned this out better if I tried. And I tried very fucking hard and, and it worked. And, uh, and the crazy part about it is I, I think profit wise, I only ended up making about maybe $300 off that $8,800. Cause you got to think about all the expenses that go into that between shelter, food, going out, etc. So what this told me was that there are people in my audience, in my industry, in the market that will pay something of four figures or more for a product or a service. Or, you know, at the end of the day, like, like I said, it's, it's a, it's a lifestyle brand for me. And what these people essentially were paying for was it had nothing to do with fantasy football. It was an experience. It was to come and I guess hang out with me. And that's, you know, and that's not in a narcissistic way, but it's like once you build up a loyalty, it's almost like they look at you. Um, how do I put this without sounding like a fucking asshole? Like, not as like a celebrity, but like these people I've been watching you. Like, think about anyone that you watch on, on YouTube or Instagram or whatever um, that you've been watching, you know, for years. And uh, if you ever saw them in person, you'd be, you'd be like a total fanboy, you know what I mean? It's not like they're not any cooler than you are. They're just normal fucking people behind a camera. 
uh, but you just spend a lot of time with them via the screen and they've given you so much value that you kind of put them on a pedestal. So that's kind of how it was. Like these people were paying to come hang out with me for a weekend and it shows me that like what better way to confirm that my lifestyle brand and my vision is, you know, is working than that, man. Because people will pay to essentially give out the best product that I would like to offer to my audience. And my plan is to um, obviously improve upon what I did last year or this previous summer um, in a million different ways to maximize the revenue and minimize the expenses and hopefully scale it up to do multiple ones of this weekend. Um, Cause that could end up being, if I do it correctly, a big, big, big money driver in the month of August. Um, but yeah, the draft day weekend was one. The next revenue stream was uh, consulting. So I actually offered consulting services where I would get on the phone, get on a video call, whatever with people in my audience for uh, 30 minutes. And this was another one where I was like, eh, I don't really know what to price myself at. I don't know, you know, what am I worth or whatever. So I ended up pricing it at $40 for 30 minutes of my time. And you equate that out to $80 an hour. Now, a lot of you guys are like, holy shit, that's a lot of money. That's way too much money. I would never pay that for this. Um, here's the thing. My most valuable asset is my time. And this should be the case for most of you guys, but I don't think 99% of you guys see it that way. And you hear it and it's like a cliche statement, but once you actually start realizing that time is your most valuable asset, you will start appropri appropriately valuing that time. And I do so through the way I charge people. Like I literally do it. I don't just talk about it or say it. That's what I'm doing. So $80 an hour, that eliminates 99% of my audience, right? Because a lot of kids, like you guys are maybe in a $50 buy-in for a league. Your league winner takes home 300 bucks. You're not gonna spend $40 to get a consulting half hour with me if you're already paying $50 just for the buy-in, right? So, so it makes no sense for a lot of people. However, there are people that play in leagues where the buy-in is $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, and if they win, they're taking home a pot of 10, 12, 15 grand. Um, so for that, they have no problem throwing $40. And that's fine with me because I don't need my whole entire audience doing this. The high end people, the people in the big leagues are the ones who are going to do this and there will be people willing to pay. That being said, admittedly, I only got on, I think five calls this entire summer, which is fine because it does take a lot of time out of my day doing those things and prepping for them and whatnot. So five times, uh, five calls times $40 for the half hour uh, equates out to $200. So that was a total for consulting, really nothing there, but that's something I could definitely improve upon if I even brought in, I outsourced that to other people to take those calls. Um, that's something, you know, these are all just different revenue streams and I'm kind of testing out and seeing what works best for me, what's the biggest revenue stream driver, where can I improve upon and what will be my main focus is going into next summer, right? It's all trial and error at this point because this is a path that no one has done before. They're obviously YouTube people and content creators that are making tons of money and they've done a lot of things, but this like uniquely to fantasy football, you've never seen it done before. Uh, and I need to experiment and see what works for me and improve upon those things. Next up is YouTube itself, AdSense. That's how you get paid for the advertisements. Now there's no like fucking formula. A lot of people ask me like, how much do you make per video, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't go strictly off views or um, subscribers or anything like that. There's like some weird formula that they have and it depends on whether or not you're putting advertisements in your video. Um, if you're putting the advertisements in the middle of your video and how, how much, how many people watch those advertisements and for how long this whole process, you can go inside of Google AdSense pretty much. And you can look at the payments that you've had. And this payment that I'm getting for October is actually a big one. Uh, it's over $760. That's the biggest one I've ever had. Um, but normally throughout the summer, I'm really only getting about a hundred and $150 a month via AdSense. That is with like in July or June or July, I might make $150 for the month, but I'm probably getting a hundred thousand to 200,000 views on my videos collectively throughout that month. So if you break that down, you know, 200,000 views, the amount of time and work and effort I put into making videos enough to get 200,000 views off of a hundred dollars for that is nothing from YouTube. So if you're ever trying to go full-time on YouTube, you're not gonna be able to. You need to have such a big audience. You need to be putting out three to four videos a week consistently forever that consistently get hundreds of thousands of views if you wanna go full-time on AdSense. It's just, it's just not gonna happen. Um, it's just another way of getting revenue. However, the cool part about this is, oh, which I, uh, it, this is included into the money you get from AdSense. So every Sunday morning I do a live stream prior to kickoff where people ask me a bunch of sit start questions and there's a feature that YouTube uses called Super Chat 
right? And I'll get like 300 people in my live streams and I'll get a million fucking questions and I can't answer them all, obviously. I usually answer like four of them. Uh, but you could super chat, which means you could, these people can actually send me money through the chat. It'll say like, oh, two ninety nine, and then I'll ask my question. So it's basically them paying for me to answer their question. And the fact that I have so much demand with the, I have hundreds of questions coming through, uh, people do feel like they need to pay in order to get this. And I never, like, I feel like that's, like, I have a lot of fucking audacity to be like, oh, I'm only answering your questions if you're super chatting me. Um, and I would never have done that in the previous three years. Like, that went against everything, I don't know, it still feels weird doing it, but now I'm to the point where I can't spread my time and my, you know, I can't spread all my resources throughout everyone that asks me a question, because I get hundreds of them every day. Um, so the people who come in through Super Chat ask me stuff, and I answer those questions. And uh, I've realized, like, throughout the year, basically, any Sunday that I go on to live stream, and I don't go on every Sunday, because sometimes I'm just hungover, I'm like, fuck this. I'll probably make between, I'm only on live stream for about an hour, I'll probably make around 50 to $80 throughout that um, hour time, which is pretty cool. So that goes into the AdSense, and that's something I can improve upon and make that like an intentional part of my revenue stream. So if I'm, if I'm going live for um, every Sunday from the beginning of July through December, and I'm gonna make 50 to $80 every time I do that, I mean, that's, that's gonna end up being a lot of money. At the end of the year, that's probably an extra like $1,500 to $2,500 right there. It adds up incrementally, you know what I mean? So that's something that I can put into this, but that goes into AdSense. So at the end of the year, well, up until this point right now, I probably made around $2,000 from YouTube AdSense. So it's not a lot of money compared to the other things that I am making money off of. The last part, and this was the most difficult part for me because think about fantasy football and just the market in the industry. There is a big gap, right? Between like December and April, May, even up to like June, where there's not a lot of money to be made because it's not the football season. So I need to like think of, I still need to, I don't have a lot of ideas for this. I need to think of ways to drive revenue during those portions. Now it's not that big of a deal if you're driving so much money throughout these couple months that it can kind of sustain you for the rest of the year. And a lot of people are like, oh, do you do fancy baseball or basketball or whatever? I don't, it's like speaking another language to me. So I, I, I wouldn't be able to do the same things that I do for that. If I did, that'd be fucking awesome because then I could just make this kind of revenue year round, but I don't. So I needed to figure out ways to do in season, at least get some money in season. Now I can't do the draft guide obviously because that's only preseason. And a lot of the stuff I did preseason doesn't convert to in-season revenue. So I started on this site called Patreon. Now, some of you guys, if you've watched my videos, you've probably heard of this by this point. Uh, Patreon is basically a website that was created to help support creators, right? So people can sign up and become a patron, a patron of mine. You can offer them anything. It's basically a platform where they can either donate money just for being good ass people because they support you or you can offer them exclusive content, exclusive packages, which is what I did. So if you wanna become a patron of mine, it is basically a monthly charge, the monthly subscription, $10 a month. And what that gets you is my personal weekly rankings, which I don't post on my YouTube or my blog or anything. So I have rankings, there's a stat sheet, there's a, a private live stream that I do every single Wednesday that you don't get access to unless you are a patron. What I was saying before is people are willing to pay for exclusivity, right? My live streams on Sunday will get 300 people. My live streams that are private to just my Patreons will get, you know, I'll have 15 people in there at a time. So I can answer all of their questions in depth and people love that, right? Cause that is, to them, that's super valuable. My time and my access, right, is super valuable. So up to this point, I have 65 Patreons and I'm getting an income of about 637 dollars a month so monthly that's that's the income and i just started this in september out of nowhere i kind of just like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna run with this so it's definitely not like tip top shape and there's definitely a lot i can improve upon but for just that for just setting it up and i'm getting probably each video i drop throughout the week uh, i'll get like one or two new patrons and i'll just plug it in i'll be like hey guys if you want a weekly live stream if you want my rankings or whatever you can go subscribe to me on patreon uh, and had i been doing that during the summer i think i'd probably have a lot more patrons on here and obviously be getting a lot more revenue through it so so that's another revenue stream so september october about 650 and then november december i'll probably make that however obviously uh people aren't going to be paying me throughout the off season to do this as well because obviously football's not going on so they don't have questions about that so they're not going to want to pay ten dollars a month i also opened up like a very exclusive 
Patreon package. So you can open up different tiers on Patreon. So I have one that's $10 a month. I also have one that's $30 a month. And that's expensive for a lot of people, right? This gives you a private email address that no one else has access to that you can email me about any, well, actually anything at all in your, in your life. I don't care. But any fantasy football questions you have, no matter how long the question is, no matter how in-depth it is, and it's a guaranteed answer from me. So uh, that's really exclusive access to me and making sure I answer all of your questions. Um, so people are willing to pay for it. I think I have a three or four people of my patrons that do that. So that's an extra $100, $120 a month, which is big. And all these things add up if you think about it, like $100, $120 a month, that's, you know, half a car payment or however you want to look at these things. But I'll say, you know, through the four months of the season, I'll probably end up with six, let's, let's put it at an even $700 a month because I expect it to increase throughout November, December. We'll say $3,000 from Patreon. And those are the revenue streams that I've been able to pull together through fantasy. Now, the big opportunities I see are advertising. If you listen to any fantasy football podcasts, any big ones like the fantasy footballers, they have, you know, Dollar Shave Club. They have the mat sleepy mattresses or whatever, you know, the different mattresses. They have Vivid Seats. They have StubHub. All these big sponsorships that pay them to plug them into their videos. And that is a huge opportunity that I see that I can have next summer when my audience is bigger. And I can't imagine the number of dollars that they bring in just off their sponsorships and plugging those companies in for 30 seconds. The CPMs are probably between 20 and $40 and the amount of streams that they probably have on their, on their videos or their podcast, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, they're making so much money per episode doing that stuff. And that's an opportunity because I did not take advantage of that throughout the season. And I'm getting probably around 10,000 views per episode. You know, 10,000 views an episode, if I have a company pay, even if they paid me $15, which I would never let them charge me that much, $15, that's, that's super cheap for the loyalty that I have with my audience, as well as being on YouTube. YouTube is, I'm so glad I built my platform via YouTube because that's the most like personalized platform to build a connection with your audience. So even if it was like $15, and they charged a $15 CPM or they gave me a $15 CPM and I was getting 10,000 views per video. Guys, that's $150 a video. If I do three videos a week, that's $450 a week. Price that out four weeks throughout the month. That's an extra $1,600 to $2,000 a month over the course of the season. You know, that could be an extra 10 grand or an extra 20 grand if I do it correctly. So all of these things are just so much opportunity. And as my audience grows, all of these things are going to grow with it. So we're gonna total these up right now. I'll use my phone as a calculator. So we have 13,500 from the draft guide. We have 445 from apparel. I'm gonna put it at 6,000 for affiliate between draft, fantasy jocks, Amazon. We'll put it at $4,500 plus 500, 5,000 for sponsors, $8,800 for draft weekend, $200 for consulting, $3,000 for Patreon, $2,000 for AdSense. Wow, this is actually a lot more money than I thought. All right, so this is the final pull in. So we're almost at $40,000 just off fantasy football guys that's fucking insane geez okay so that's like forty thousand dollars and last year like i said last summer i made probably around two thousand dollars guys so that was the incremental jump i made in terms of revenue and in terms of money however you gotta understand that there are expenses to all this stuff this is not just straight profit right revenue is just the money you bring in Profit is the money you take home. So you have the revenue, but there are also expenses. You take the revenue, which is that, minus the expenses that occurred, and that is your profit. So for the large, large majority of this stuff, the investment is not an expense. It's a time. It's time, right? I put a lot of time into making, doing the research for my videos, putting that out, and, and those kind of things. So that's the biggest investment. Um, however, I do invest in equipment, my computer, I invest in upgrading my camera, in the microphone, in the, you know, the other accessories and all of this kind of shit. And my mentor, my business coach, my books, education, all these things are business expenses and they're going to, they're going to happen year over year. You're always going to be wanting to upgrade things. You're always going to be wanting to up the production. Those are the expenses that go into it. Draft day weekend. Like I said, I only made probably $300, $400 off the weekend. So if you take away about $8,500 in revenue, you're still looking at about $30,000 in profit, which is fucking crazy. Each summer I do this, you know, I'm going to be able to make that, that revenue to expense ratio better and better because I know what works for certain things and what doesn't. And there's so much room for growth and opportunity here. That doesn't include my marketing stuff, right guys? So I also do social media marketing. I, I run paid traffic for uh, e-commerce businesses and online businesses. Um, so none of that revenue brings that into account. And again, I'm not doing this to brag. I'm doing this just to look, this is almost just like me looking back and, and 
kind of, you know, I never step back. I'm always stressed. And I'm always like, I could do better and I could do better. And I wish I had done this differently. But every once in a while, you kind of got to step back and, and like, I'm proud of myself for the stuff that I've brought in, man. Because two years ago, I was working a full-time job where I was making good money. Um, and I took a chance. I took a risk leaving that job to follow a passion of mine because uh, I had a vision, man. And, and you know, I've never wavered from that vision. I've never wavered from the path that I've taken and it's just cool to see this stuff come to fruition i don't know i'm just taking a minute to kind of let this sink in because i didn't realize that the money was the, the number was this high and plus the marketing dollars i've i've made this year i'm probably making more money this year than i did with my actual full-time job when i was working 10 hours a day commuting to new york city that being said like i want to inspire you guys and understand that this is not unrealistic for any of you if you have a passion or a hobby, I truly, 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 truly believe that if you are able to convey your passion or a hobby to other people and give them valuable information about it, and if you consistently create content around your passion for a few years, you will be able to pull off something like this. Like, I truly believe that is the way of the world, man. And you're not gonna become a millionaire. You're not gonna be the next Casey Neistat that's just real. It's not going to happen. However, if you're self-aware with yourself and you realize, like if I realize, if I sit down and I'm like, you know, if, if a few years ago someone came up to you and said, hey, listen, you can quit your job right now. If you work really hard over the next two, three years, I'm going to give you an $80,000 salary just talking about fantasy football. Would you say yes to that? Fuck yeah, you would say yes to that. Uh, and that is the case for a lot of people. You just have to realize that when you're making that money, like, are you actually okay with that? Or do you want to make more money? I knew from the onset, I always said, like, if I can make, you know, $60,000 a year, $80,000 a year, $100,000 a year doing what I love, I would be infinitely happy. You know, I would much rather talk about fantasy football for $80,000 a year than do something that I don't like that much and be miserable and not have uh, freedom over my time for $250,000 a year. And I mean that. If someone walked up to me today and offered me a job for $250,000 salary, I would say no to it in a second, as long as it wasn't something I loved, obviously. Um, but a typical business job, no, I would not take it, guys. I'm telling you, like, I, I promise you that. There are things that are more valuable to me. Like I said, my time, my freedom, my flexibility, my my creative outlets and my, you know, my drive to, to improve upon this and building what I'm doing is just, it, it's, it's so much fun for me. It's awesome. And there are definitely a lot of downsides to it. I won't say that it's all fucking glitter and gold. I put a fuckload of hard work into this. I don't want to, I don't want it to seem that it's easy. Cause when I tell you that you could do it, if putting out content consistently for a few years, that's the formula. Like that's not fucking easy. That is hours and hours and hours and hours of work a week, translating into dozens of hours of work a month to hundreds and hundreds of hours of work per year in order for this to happen. It's a lot of fucking hard work and you do have to be good, but it's very, very possible. And I think we're going to start seeing a shift. I mean, we already have, there's so many influencers and content creators that are making a living off that stuff. Um, but I think it's going to be even more and more and more of a shift as we're seeing like the education system itself. A lot of, a lot more people are choosing to be entrepreneurs. They just haven't realized that the way to build a business is through content. I truly believe that content is the king to building a business. Now, you could be so good at your craft and your tactic, but unless you are building out content and becoming an expert in your field, no one's going to buy your shit. So we're seeing a shift more towards entrepreneurship. People haven't realized that content is the key to making the money and bringing in the revenue. So that is, that is what I'm going to leave you with today, guys. And this was, um, I hope as an eye opening as a video for you guys, as it was for me. And I hope you're able to take away something from this. And if you have any questions, man, feel free to leave a comment down below. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. Yeah, man, I'm just still trying to process everything. So leave a comment down below. You can email me anytime you want if you have any questions or if you want to if you want to talk about any of this stuff or if you want, you know, if you want help getting started. And I think, honestly, I think at the end of the day, what I want to do long term is eventually once I've built out a big business and once I've, you know, successfully made a lot of money and and, and you know, gotten to that point where I'm like, yep, I've done it, right? I did this. I would love to help people out. I would love to help younger, the younger generation out and be a mentor or a coach to them. Like people that were in my position maybe a couple of years ago, 
I would love to step in and be a business coach, right? That would be my form of, of income, would be a, a coach or something that helps those younger, the younger demographic out. Like someone like me that they could have come to when they were younger. That's the ultimate goal here. And going back to content, man, like this piece of content right here is the reason why, why some people will sign up with me when I do eventually make that transition. You don't realize it, it's all these subconscious things that happen. You will look at me and you'll be like, oh my God, he's done it, right? Because I saw that piece of content proving he's done it. And that will be the driver of your sales. This is marketing itself right now for my long-term vision, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. That is basically the gist of what I'm talking about. But that's gonna be the end of the episode, guys. Thumbs up if you enjoyed, comment if you have any questions or if y'all just wanna talk, because I love bullshitting with you. And I'll I'll see y'all on the next vlog. When you sleep in, in hotel rooms, when your family is dying, when you down on the bottle, when you slamming the car door.